You just heard from Jeff Norman from SAIC as part of our webinar on how utilities are using cellular today. And now we're going to finish up with some questions. We've got a, a couple of questions from Ross and Charles and several others around quality of service. And now I understand that none of you can speak for the carriers. But these questions were more along the lines of uh, to guarantee the right kind of quality of service and uptime and prioritization, especially in times of disaster, storm outages, et cetera. Do you have any recommendations for the utility, either what they should be doing or how they should set up their operation or what they should ask for when they're negotiating with carriers? So I touched on some of this earlier, but I this is Jason. But what I recommend is going in and really just speaking about what it is you want to accomplish and what your requirements are and not take for granted any preconceived notions and just very simply state, this is my application, these are my requirements, uh, what can you do, uh, Mr. Carrier, to help me? And I honestly think given the motivation and the incentives to win your business, you will see a very fair discussion uh, about what can be done and um, tr really try and meet your needs. From a technology standpoint, quality of service, the ability to prioritize traffic exists in 3G and 4G solutions. Um, and is certainly being more proliferated in the network infrastructure in 4G. In terms of outage restoration and preparedness for emergency management, this is a topic that the carriers anywhere in the world I have a strong comprehension of, and uh, as I learned from AT&T, uh, they're even willing to sell you infrastructure and portable infrastructure that you can use in conjunction with them to augment their own restoration efforts. And I've heard this from other carriers as well, whereby if, if there's coverage uh, perhaps that they don't currently support, uh, that they're very interested in working with you to uh, expand the coverage and to meet your needs uh, no matter where you are. Terrific. We uh, heard uh, from Mike who wanted to know if Qualcomm has uh, development tools or sample code or reference architectures that can aid in application development. Sure, this is Samir. Let me take that. Actually, we do have a at least one platform that we recently announced specifically for the M2M or Internet of Everything market that could be applied to uh, smart meter development. We are coming up with additional ones that are based on the chipset that I spoke about, the 8K and 9K platforms, very shortly. And we realize that this is an area that uh, we, we need to participate in by providing the tools, uh, the hardware reference platforms and designs, along with a software development toolkit that allows the application developers or the, uh, the utilities or, or their um, suppliers to start creating applications and proving out those concepts. And, and we're very actively working on that. I can certainly provide more information on that if you get in touch with me uh, privately after this. Well, here's a, an interesting one. Prahash, but also several others, had questions that were basically asking, should a utility ever consider setting up a dedicated or private cellular network, so their own cellular network rather than using a public carrier, but still using cellular technology. Has that ever been considered, or was that uh, price prohibitive? Um, so it is being considered, and it has actually been deployed. We saw SP Osnet go with a cellular network using WiMAX, and uh, we see other utilities around the world. And the thing that one just has to consider is, Am I building out a network that has overcapacity to what I can actually uh, leverage? And what is the related cost of building out and maintaining my own private network, even if it's cellular? And am I fully, uh, taking full advantage of the network that I've actually built? And in some cases, I think you'll see that the economics may suggest that it does make better sense to work with a commercial carrier whose business is to bring in multiple revenue sources and can afford the ongoing investments. Having said that, certainly uh, it can be considered, and it is a nice way to augment. 
Uh, but one of the benefits of working with a commercial carrier is the solutions uh, by the telecom industry, and, and in particular Qualcomm, we're supporting uh, specific frequency bands uh, that are in high use. And there's certifications that go along with that, which you really benefit and, and get the benefit of economies of scale. So it's not that something that I would rule out, but it's certainly something that you would really have to think about and, and run the numbers to make sure that it actually makes sense. Here's a question for Jeff Norman of SAIC, and we had an attendee ask about mixed networks, and if your models uh, take that into consideration, power line communication, RF plus cellular, is that uh, something people should consider? And, and when is cellular the right and best choice? Some criteria for evaluating that. Yeah, so it's always difficult in a, in a webinar type of environment because everybody has their own uh, environment they find themselves in, Jesse. But yeah, I, I believe that there is an opportunity for a platform to incorporate both wired and wireless. I think that as you look at the disparate size of these footprints, I think that it only should come into play. Uh, so you're going to have to look at uh, how you integrate those particular technologies into a common platform. And as we saw in some of my earlier slides, you are starting to see some of the mechanical integrators out there provide communications modularity. And by that I mean WAN and a different form of LAN communications. It's not one size fits all. And then I do think as you look at, particularly look at a, a TNMP or you look at an area where you want to realize value for the business today and you can't wait on infrastructure to be there, uh, it does make sense to leverage an infrastructure such as public carrier that's already there. In particular, when you look at efficiencies for these larger utilities and you look at these mega mergers up and down the East Coast, how do you take a platform and replicate it in each and every service footprint that you're in? I think that cellular could be that common denominator and could play a significant role as you look at those grid modernization efforts. Terrific. Uh, one final question, and this is from Gene, but there was a number that were similar, and there's just a continuing concern, and we've touched on this uh, a couple times, but uh, I want to try and alleviate people's uh, questions. It's being concerned that a cellular network will get overwhelmed at certain times. And Gene was using the comment of when the Pope was announced that suddenly there was no cellular service available you know, for a while from that area in Rome. And, and in a disaster or other situation, you might have that. Again, I know you can't speak for the carriers, but just from a theoretical point of view, how, how can that be handled? Uh, sure, let me take that. Actually, we have done a number of simulations to test out that scenario. We, we looked at a number of different locations around the world that are very heavily populated or densely populated, including Manhattan and the uh, Nakano Ward in Tokyo, which has 240,000 meters in about a 16 square mile area. That translates to about 15,000 households per square kilometer. And what happens is as you have higher density population and higher density meters, you have a lot more sector carriers uh, deployed by the operators in those in those areas just to be able to keep up with the normal cellular traffic. So, for example, in, in that, they have 359 meters per sector carrier. And uh, our simulations were done to ensure that if you had a baseline of four uh, users at any given point in time, kind of that, that's sort of the average being uh, on that network, even when you had a multi-interval meter reading happening every 30 minutes, it only affected your uplink capacity by about 1.9%. Uh, and that's in that very densely populated area in the Nakano Ward. In, in New York, in Manhattan, that was about 1.2%. Okay. And that's with a meter reading every 30 minutes. So we've, we've run these simulations in, uh, you know, with, with very, very um, high concentrations of meters. And it and shows that it really doesn't affect the network all that much. Uh, real world use cases will probably be significantly less than that. Thank you. We've run out of time, but here's our personal links if you want to reach out and get in touch with anybody individually. I want to say thank you to Jason Ellis, to Sanvir Gujral, and to Jeff Norman, and thank you as well for joining us. I hope we'll see you again very soon at another Smart Grid News webinar. Smart Grid News webinar. Smart Grid News webinar. Smart. Grid news webinar. Smart.